we, um, re- looking at that video, it sort of gives you a clarion call, a great commission. You know, we had Easter last week, and of course Christ resurrected, ascended, sat down on the right hand of the Father. Um, and now, the, before, he appeared to the disciples, and he gave them what we call the great commission, go into all the world with all the gospel. Now, with that said, about numerous, uh, I, I, I guess I, I challenge it, I track it by churches. There's five churches ago we had, that when we were at the on, on 74th Terrace, that we had a missionary come in and speak one afternoon, one, one Sunday morning, I guess it was a Sunday morning, and we had this open session that we asked, and an, he answered questions, and I asked him a question, what are the biggest challenges facing you in his, his mission field was Africa, in Africa. And in my mind, because I'm just, think like this, I'm thinking, well, I know that answer. I was actually trying to do some fundraising for him. The answer is, I don't have enough money. I don't have enough money to do this, don't have enough money to do that, don't have enough money to do this. And I figured that would be his answer. But he, was, he, would, he didn't say that, he didn't mention money. In fact, he said something that really took me off guard. He said, um, the biggest challenge we face on the mission field, and the missionaries that I know on the mission field, is marriages. I said, Whoa, okay. He goes, most of the missionaries I know, or at least a good percentage of them, are, are battling in their marriage, having a difficult time staying on the field. Not because they don't have support. They have support. They just can't get along. They can't reconcile the mission field and marriage. They can't reconcile ministry and marriage. They can't reconcile child rearing and the mission field. It's all the pressure, all the above. It's not working for them. And more people come home because of family disruptions and probably anything else. And Pastor Lewis, you probably would attest to that, being ahead of IAGM. So this morning, we, we talk a lot about the gospel and, and, um, and the impact and the application of the gospel in our life. And, and I felt sense about a month or two ago to spend a month of April talking about relationships and how the gospel applies to relationships. Now you say it's all about marriage. Well, it will be a lot about marriage, but we're not going to talk all about marriage. We're going to talk about relationships interbody relationships in your workplace. We're going to talk about any, anything that's relational, it's being single. We're going to talk about being single, what it means to be single. A lot of our folks are single. Singleness is a real thing. Loneliness will come up in this series. won't come up today, but sometime in the next three weeks it'll come up after today. So there are many different, when I talk about marriage, as you know, my background is in counseling and my trainings in counseling and and we do everything a lot of crisis and grief counseling especially now Um, but more than anything else we've done marriage and family um, counseling nothing I set out to be I get asked sometimes in the in the world what do you do for a living I say I well I'm a full-time counselor I'm a part-time pastor (laughs) part-time preacher and I I do say that because I find myself talking with a lot of folks sometimes in the office more on the phone than anything else about about families and how to make this marriage work how to make this gospel work there are really some good tools out there and I've used them all and will continue to use them. There's the five love languages. Who's heard of the five love languages? Really good. I, 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 um, I would say use it. I, I use it to help, um, especially in real crisis situations. I use it um, when the marriage is just about a nuclear cloud. I'll use the, the love languages. Because what the love languages will do will give you a clue and a roadmap sort of, of how your spouse is is wired. This is how this is how they're wired. Good, good, good program. Good. Um, then there's um, love and respect. Real good one. We use that in marriage university. We had marriage university for two or three years here, and we ended up not having any students or just a handful. I was so blessed, but no one came to marriage university because I realized all my marriages were perfect in the church at that point. But we had marriage university so people could have an access to some helps in their marriage on a day-to-day basis. And and we use love and respect. The basic need of woman is love and the basic need of man is respect. Really good video series. I tell you the people who did it, but I never pronounced their last name. And um, and, and um, they were funny, easy to listen to. I couldn't recommend it better anymore. Then there's another one out there called Prepare and Enrich, probably the number one premarital assessment program, but I use it for marital and, um, and premarital. 
It's a 45-minute or so assessment program that you do online, and then it takes 10 different areas of relationships and charts them out, and you can see areas of compatibility and areas of incompatibility. So in premarital session, you can know what areas, this is an area we need to focus on, but we need to focus on finances, we need to focus on family relations or whatever, and it's a just it's not really counsel, it's a roadmap. Good, cool. You have to go to, I had to go to a whole day seminar just to learn how to do it. So I haven't done it myself yet because I'm afraid it will tell me. <laughs> so preparing and rich, great. I do a lot of couples with it, and it gives us, shows us what's working in the marriage, what isn't working in the marriage. Those are all wonderful um, programs, and they all deal with um, symptoms of a, of a bigger problem. Not against the using them, but as we'll see here in a, mo- in a moment, well, let me just back up a little bit. Slow myself down. <sighs> Use these programs. If you've, I've been through Love and Rich. I mean Love and Rich. Preparing and Rich. Do it again. I'd read the five love languages. When? 17 years ago. Read it again. I love love and respect. I went through it seven years ago. Do it again. Because you always consistently need to be rehearsing these things. I read at least one book on, a mar- on marriage every year. I'm waiting for one that I can say, finally, something blames my wife. <laughs> it's never happened. And I try to read them with my wife. She just... Honey, read this one page. Don't read this page. That applies to me. But I think this applies to you. You can read that right here. No, I never tried that. I love my life too much. (laughs) And um, so so there is, um, but read this stuff. Use these tools. Practice it. Rehearse it. Don't just do something and say, because I guarantee what you learned 15 years ago probably isn't impacting you like it still could today. Rehearse these things. Now, now I'll get on with the message. Good as these programs are, my friends, they're Band-Aids. Band-Aids are, are good. My daughter loves Band-Aids. She came home, Dad, would you help me put this Band-Aid in? Last night before she went to bed. She said, sure, honey. So I take the Band-Aid. Where do you want me to put it? Right here. Get my flashlight. There was a speck there. It might have been ink. And, uh, and so I put a Band-Aid on, and she felt so much better when I put the Band-Aid on. Because Band-Aids make us feel good. Kids love fixing boo-boos. But again, if I have this open sore on my arm, I put a Band-Aid on it, but the sore is coming from an internal disease, the Band-Aid's just going to maybe cover up a little bit, but it's not going to take care of the disease, is it? I think it's much more effective to go, to go after what's causing the not the symptoms, but the cause. You know, if you're in the health and nutrition, sometimes medicine will just tr- treat the symptoms, and another approach is just to go after the cause. This series, we'll, we'll talk about some things, symptom and practical things, but um, especially this morning's message, I'm going after the cause. Where these issues come from in the first place. And that is simple enough, my friends, our fallen natures. These need-based, need-filled individual things called people. And we all come into a marriage with our own baggage, our own stuff. And that's where I think we find our problems. Let's read. First New Testament book written, to my knowledge anyway, 49 AD. This was the book of James. Now figure this. If Jesus was um, crucified in 33 AD, and this was about 49 AD, it's about 15, 16 years after the crucifixion, the, the church had not been dispelled at this point out of Jerusalem. That didn't happen in 70 AD. So the church is still pretty much centralized in Jerusalem at this point. And here's James. He writes to this local church, just a group of believers like you. He says, if you are wise and understand God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works with humility that comes from wisdom. And watch this. But if you are bitterly jealous and there is selfish ambition in your heart, don't cover up the truth with boasting and lying. For jealousy jealousy and selfishness is not the kind of wisdom It's not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly, unspiritual, 
and demonic. It's pretty strong. For whenever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, you will find disorder and evil of every kind. But the wisdom from above is, first of all, pure. Now, I think the word wisdom should be worked on a little bit here. That's the word Sophia in the Greek New Testament. And, and, it, and it's, um, it's how to, I'm quoting Spiro Zodiades, the guy who wrote the Hebrew-Greek Key Study Bible. He says, it's how to regulate one's relationship with God. Wisdom is what I get through the Holy Spirit and how to walk with God. So it's wisdom from above, Holy Spirit-inspired. So, but the wisdom from above is, first of all, pure. It is also peace-loving, gentle at all times. That wisdom, because it gets, comes from God, is willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and good deeds and shows no favoritism and is always sincere. So wisdom from above, God's wisdom, this is how I walk with God, is I have these things in place. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. Now, I, that's the end of chapter 3. I'm going to pick up in chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. For what is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from evil desires at war within you? That's quite a strong statement to a church. You want what you don't have, so you scheme and you kill to get it. <laughs> this is a church. <laughs> you are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and you wage war to take it away from them, yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. So we have here in this first century, 15 years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have um, a church full of um, strife, full of manipulation, full of envy, full of covetedness. Now, I'm not, let me just take a step back. I've been pastoring the church for 30 years. It's, um, you guys are awesome. You really are. I've had 30 years of peace. I've had church issues, but um, never internal. The people I work with every day are wonderful. You are wonderful. You, there's no strife amongst you, not that I'm aware of anyway. And if it is, I just give it to Pastor Goldberg to deal with. And, um, and, and um, you guys are great. We've never had fights over hot dogs in the vestibule. We've never had any, any, any of these major church splits. No one ever fights about the color of this or the color of that. It's, just, it's been 30 years of peace. And I thank you for that. Because I, I read stuff from other pastors. They go through horror stories. Horror stories. I talked about the hot dog split. That actually happened in the church in, in West Palm Beach. Pastor Burnside was part of it. They sold hot dogs outside, and it, it offended a bunch of people, and people sp church split over the hot dog controversy. You guys are great. So none of this is aiming at this. What I'm trying to show you is that there's a wisdom from above that impacts our horizontal relationships in the body of Christ, in our families, in our marriages. How do we have relationships that truly please God, godly relationships? First of all, we own our own stuff. It's important. A couple practical things here. In other words, some are not aware of their own motives. They never trace their reaction. They never trace the bitterness um, or anger back to its true source. We use the illustration a lot. We spoke on this a year or so ago, I guess. If somebody pushes your button, maybe you've said that, that person pushes my button. They come in the room, and next thing I know, my hackles are up. I get angry, and they said something to me, and that pushed my buttons. Oh, I wanted to flatten the air in their tires. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to steal their donut in a coffee shop. I'm out for blood. They push my button. The question you want to ask yourself is, why do you have a button? What's the button connected to? You see, I have a, a doorbell at my house. My doorbell's a little thing, a little thing on my, in front of my door. You've seen them. Who's seen a doorbell before? 
three of you. Okay, wow, you guys live in old houses because I've had a doorbell for years. And it's a little doorbell, and you press that button, but the, it's just a bell. It's just a button, but behind the buttons, these wires. And the wires run through the wall down my hallway to a little bell that's way down my hallway in front of the kids' rooms. So, so the, the, that little button doesn't do anything. It just is connected to something else. And in order to make that bell ring, that button needs to be pushed. See, some of us blame the button, but you need to take the wiring back to where the source is, where the noise is, where the bell is. And you never do that, so all you do is point at the button. That button, well, that button's connected to something. So we own it. Own our stuff. Yes, I'm insecure. Yes, I'm fearful. Yes, I've been neglected in other relationships or betrayed in other relationships, so I'm bringing my stuff into this relationship. I'm owning it. Yes, I get my identity. I need, I need people's affirmation. I need people's love. I need the pats on the back. If I don't get it, I feel very insecure and very self-conscious. Own it. Don't go in operation manipulation to try to get it, especially in marriage. Is there a wounded spirit in me? Does a person remind me of somebody else who hurt me? Do they trigger a fear or insecurity or a need? Do they bring back a past rejection, maybe? And so I'm filtering everything in my relationships today through something that happened in my past. If I can put somebody's name on my biggest misery then I have likely not traced back my button. I likely has not taken a real inventory of what's going on inside of me. The word of God promises me in Hebrews 4.12 to investigate me, to search me out, to let me know my true motives of my heart and what's really going on inside of me. We have not likely, in most cases, let the Holy Spirit of God ever speak truth into ourselves, mostly because, maybe because, I have never given him the opportunity to do such. I've said this many times, I'll say it again, and, and uh, I read stuff on marriage, family, because it's, you know, it's my circle, I, I read all the time. And, and, um, and then I, I read the scriptures every day, I'm reading, I think, five different books as we speak, and, and it's one, I never, I never get a word on somebody else. God told me that you're not submitting to him in certain areas of your life. God's never told me about other people, which is really a bummer. He tells me about myself all the time. He's never told me anything. He has told me about some things. He told me about Andre one time. God spoke to me about Andre. I was praying, and that's what God said. You know, Tim, I really love him. Getting anything more juicy than that? God, I, 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 knew, I knew that already. I read that in the Bible. Exactly. It was in the Bible. I already knew it. He didn't tell me anything else juicy about Andre. I asked him. <laughs> it's plenty. Yeah, Cheryl's told me plenty. But, 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 uh, but, uh, but, he, but God hasn't shown me anything. God shows me about myself. God showed me where I can be a better husband, not, never where my wife can be a better wife. So I own my own stuff. Then we fix what we need to fix. Sometimes there's nothing to fix, sometimes there is. After we own our own stuff, we take steps to fix our part of the relationship that was broken. I might have to say the words of the guillotine. I'm sorry. Oh, my knuckles. The digging into the table, I'm sorry. I'm wrong. I'm sorry I did this to you. And be specific. Define this. What's this? Whatever that is. Because I've had plenty of people come up to me and say, if I've ever hurt you, well, actually you have. And you know how you've hurt me. Own it. That doesn't help me. But when someone comes to me, I'm so sorry I did this to you. I slandered you. I said this to you, about you, behind your back. I so appreciate that. It is real specific, real clear. You want healing? Be clear. Don't leave any details out. Be concise. 
And now this is important. Don't wait for a response. Okay, I'm going to go to this person. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me, honey, for the way I treated you, how I spoke nasty to you. Please forgive me. And um, I wish we, we never fought about that. Are you saying something? Wait, wait, she didn't reciprocate it. She just said, thank you. But she didn't say she did anything wrong. That's not right. I was very humble. I was very humble. And I said, I'm sorry first. Shouldn't she say, I'm sorry second? I was, hum- I was more humble than she was. I said it first. She should say, I'm sorry second. She didn't. Wow. Then fine. I'll never say, I'm sorry again then. <laughs> Somebody did that once. <laughs> Now, this is a key. It's not about how they respond. It's about you and God. It's about you fixing it with God. So you can honestly pour your heart out to this person and, and, re, and come clean to this person. Then you can walk away in the spirit of God and liberty because you know that you've done right with God. This person may forgive you. They may not forgive you. They may try to emotionally torture you a little bit more. They may lay a guilt trip on you more. They may shovel some more stuff on. Now here's the hard part. You may be 2% wrong and they, be not, they may be 98% wrong and you make your 2% right and they don't own their 98 percent that's wrong that is between them and God you walk away with your two percent clean and know that God takes account of it all and you'll be rewarded such eternally Malachi 3 16 think of that you are humble enough to fix it you are meek enough to fix it and God saw it now flip side of this I'm the person over here Somebody repents to me. I'm glad you finally saw this. All right. I forgive you. Fine. You know what I'm saying? If somebody's humble enough to to repent to you, receive it. Receive it. Fix whatever you got to fix and go on. Don't treat it cavalierly. I've seen some, so many times someone says, finally, and they just pile it back on. Well, I couldn't believe you actually said that to me. I'm glad you're saying that. I couldn't believe you actually said that. What were you thinking anyway? Somebody fixes it with you, accept it, and go on. Bury it, because Christ did, and go on. Now, that said, without the gospel, what we're talking about here, Every relationship is curse-filled. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm stealing a term from this book. Grace, Families Where Grace is in Place. Highly recommend you read it. It's a cheap book on Amazon. I have it on my Kindle. I keep giving them away because I have people come out. You've got to read this book, and I keep giving them away. So I stopped buying them. I put it on Kindle, so now you have to buy it. So, so, so getting free from the burden of pressuring, controlling, manipulating your spouse and your children. Great book. I actually read it the first time in my marriage class in, in Bible college. So um, and I recommend, I'm going to quote him a little bit, John, um, Jeff Van Vonderen. He has a great book on addictions and different things like that. But he talks about curse-filled versus grace-filled relationships in the book. Here's a curse-filled relationship. Number one, controlling. This is all an acronym. This is to control and manipulate and try to make the other person something they want them to be. However that is and however that works out. Controlling, then it's unforgiving. These people get historical quick. Ephesians 4.32, instead be kind to one another. Tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Wow. The unforgiving, they use terms like you always. You never. You always do this. You never do that. Go, get absolutely historical on you. Now, that's the simple way. that We all do have done that at some point. What about, what about the stuff that happened 35 years ago? Remember, you did that 35 years ago. 
30 years ago, 25 years ago, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago, you hurt me. I thought you forgave them. No. Well, yeah, I did. Yeah, I just haven't forgotten it yet. I keep it in my easy to access file when my emotions get a little bit worked up or a little hurt so I can pull it right out and use it. And if you really hurt me, I have this in my thermonuclear file over here. I won't use that but once or twice a year. But if we ever get into a big fight, I'm going to nuke you with this puppy right here. I thought you forgave me of that. No. Oh, I did. Yes, I did. But it wounded me so badly that I just had to bring it up again and 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 again. 35 years later. Relationships, my friend, there is no way you can have a relationship without being vulnerable. There's no way you can have a relationship without opening yourself up to somebody else and giving them the ability to hurt you. When you share your heart with somebody and when you trust somebody with a confidence, whether that's horizontally, maritally, however you do that, you've just given them authority to hurt you. And there's no way to do it and not be vulnerable. There is no real relationship without being vulnerable. Then we, have, we become reactive. This is our damage control. I react with strong emotions to keep everyone in place and keep everyone in place where I want them to be. You see, I need you to treat me a certain way and act a certain way. I need you to spend a certain amount of time with me. And if you don't do these, because I don't feel good about myself unless you do, as subtle as this is, so I'm going to react And if you happen to point something out in me, maybe you shouldn't feel this way or think that way. I'm not hearing that from you. You don't know what's going on in me, and you react. And your emotions go up, and your voice raises up, so the other person just shrinks right back down because I don't want to go through that war. And you may win that particular battle, but you're losing the whole war, my friends, because nothing ever gets resolved, nothing ever gets healed, nothing ever gets to see the glory of God come upon it. Van Vonderon said this about reaction. So when your sense of well-being comes from the performance of another, it was good. In fact, you are assigning that person a lot of power over you. Their words and behavior have power to indict or to vindicate. Indict or vindicate. The other person has the power to establish your self-esteem or to destroy it. Under the curse, the byword is control or be controlled curse-filled relationships. Then they have shaming. This is a big one. Shaming is the belief that you are defective, worthless, and unlovable. That's what shame is. It's not something wrong with your behavior. It's something wrong with you as a person. That's a shame-filled person. We use shaming all the time in marriages and families. Maybe you've said a statement like this. What's wrong with you? No one? Never said that to the kids, your husband, wife. What's wrong with you anyway? What are you saying? There's something wrong with you. Your person. You can say, you know, that's just not the right way to act. And that's true. But what's wrong with you? You're saying there's something wrong with you. What do you mean, honey, you're not going to come to church today? What do you mean? I mean, what are the kids going to think if you don't come to church? What type of example are you making for the children? I like it when you sit next to me in church. If you don't come to church, I'm going to give more in the offering. That was a joke. (laughs) What What am I doing? I'm shaming them. So a wife gets up or a husband gets up, shames their, their spouse into coming to church or their kids are coming to church. Is that spirit-driven or curse-driven? We can be reactive or we can respond. Parents are great at this. It's placing, shaming is placing myself above you, trying to make you try harder to be who I need you to be for me. I don't accept you 
for who you are. I'm try, making you try harder so you can be who I need you to be for me. Then we have ego-driven or simply self-centered. Ego is the Greek word for I. I want my kids to be a certain way so people will think well of my parenting skills. I want my husband or my wife sitting next to me arm in arm so people will see a happy marriage. I've had people tell me before, my, my spouse is so much more affectionate to me during church and after church. They put their arm around me, they hold my hand, but then we get home and it all stops. Could it be that the I part of us is just trying to create an image that doesn't really exist? For what you want to do something other than I want, that means I must not matter to you. What do you mean? You don't want to go to the mall with me? That's just, don't you love me? You should want, you should want to come to the mall with me and walk through the store and touch every garment, not buy anything. You can see I've been emotionally scarred by this already. And, and, um, and, um, and, and, then, and, just, and then, and just look at that. Then I can answer the same question. Do you like this? Yes, I love that. Do I like this? Yes, I love that. Do you like this? Yes, I love that. Do you think I should buy it? Yes, yes. I just buy anything, please. Just buy it. And, um, and, um, and, and, and so, and so it goes back on the shelf. We walk away not buying anything. And the one thing I say, no, I don't really like that. That's what we buy. That's never happened to me. <laughs> See, what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm getting at is um, if I think that somehow I have to do everything my spouse says, got to like the same things they like, do everything the same thing they like, so they'll be, um, then I'll feel like I have a good sense about my relationship. That's called ego-driven relationships. Cursed-filled relationships, my friends, are exhausting. They're exhausting. They're impossible. You work and you work and you work, and sometimes they never get resolved. And 10 years later, 15 or 20 years later, they're exhausting. You just can't do it anymore. So after we try everything, and the best that I do is produce a poorly trained spouse, we break out the answer, the secret weapon, if I want to use that term. And that, my friends, is simple this, simply this, the gospel. What did Christ give us to meet every one of man's needs? The gospel. He didn't come up with a counseling program. He gave us the gospel. He said, this is, my, this is, this is going to be the answer for your marriage. This is going to be the answer for your family. This is going to be the answer for your self-esteem. This is going to be the answer for your needs. This is going to be the answer for your identity. I've given you everything you need right here on my cross. In this cross is all of my wisdom, all of my power, all of my love. It's all wrapped into that cross so I can give you everything you, can, you, can, you need in life to live. Now, I got this, I forgot. This is a cool illustration. You've never seen this before, ever. It's my gospel umbrella. Look at that. I saw singing in the rain the other day with Sadie. It made me think about it. So I'm singing in the rain. I, if it was raining in here, I'd dance around a, fan, a, a light post. The gospel umbrella. See, I stay under the umbrella. I'm going to show you this a little bit later. If, if, who, who was out in the rain yesterday? Who was out in the rain without an umbrella? I was. My hair got well, it was a mess. It just it went all over the place. <laughs> and um, and and it's um. But those who had an umbrella, my wife and Sadie had an umbrella. Their hair was fine. Mine just ran right down. I needed windshield wipers. And um and so there's so. But, but this is how it was designed. Now if it's pouring rain. Do I walk through the pouring rain like this? Why am I getting soaked? This doesn't make any sense. No, I stay under the umbrella. This is the this is the gospel umbrella. Christ has given me everything through his gospel, but I walk through life like this. Why am I getting wet? Why am I soaked? Why is my hair a mess? I don't understand. I'm getting drenched. Put the umbrella on. My marriage isn't working. My family isn't working. My self-esteem isn't working. Nothing's working for me. That husband is not giving me what I need. That wife is not giving me the affection I need. Those kids are acting weird. 
really weird. Yeah, Amelia, I know you. You define weird, I know. <laughs> Put the umbrella on. Get under the umbrella of God's covering, of his gospel. I'll come back to the umbrella in a little bit. Keep that right there. I'm going to put it right here so you can read it. Isn't that cool? Yvonne Long did that for me. Now, the first three chapters of Ephesians talk about our riches in Christ. I've said that many times to you. Then you see the second half of Ephesians, 4, 5, and 6, talk about practical life, marriage, family, interpersonal relationships. So let's pick up in, in chapter 4, verse 1. I therefore, Paul's talking, I therefore, and now therefore always goes back. I therefore, in light of everything we've said in chapters 1, 2, and 3. We take chapters 1, 2, and 3, and everything we've said, the riches in Christ, all spiritual blessings, seated together with Christ in the heavenly places, all those incredible verses, saved by grace, um, given poems of God, 2.10 workmanship, ordained unto good works, all the incredible verses, forgiven, 1-7, um, in the first three chapters. And he says, in light of that, I, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you've been called. I want you to walk worthy of this gospel which I've revealed to you. And this is how you do it, by working really, really hard. No, he says, you're worthy of the gospel by, by living with all humility, gentleness, with patience, Bearing one another in love. Now, there's so many passages like this in the New Testament. I'm just going to focus on this one and, and break this down for you so we can define this really clear, what it means to be under the gospel umbrella. First, he says, be humble. Humility. This word is a lowliness of minds which springs from a true estimate of yourselves. A deep sense of your own smallness and demerit. In other words, I know where I've come from. No one has to tell and point out my faults. I know a lot more about my faults than you do. You only see my outward faults. I know my inward faults. I know I'm a mess. I had somebody come into the office years ago, and he's um, told me their life story, and it was pretty colorful, a very colorful life story. So they're telling me all the exploits they did, their time in jail, how they got to jail, and what they did in jail, and all this stuff, and at the end of it, he, he just, um, he looked at me and said, so what do you think? And I didn't know, quite even know what he was saying. He's still my friend to this day. He doesn't come to our church because he's out of God's will. <laughs> I'm kidding. And, um, and, and I said, I think um, we should go to Starbucks. <laughs> and then we went to Starbucks. In other words, he, was, he expected me to be shocked at his depravity. Like we said many times, sinner sin, dogs bark. I mean, depravity is manifest in different ways. The same grace, as we said Wednesday night, cheered for me when I got saved in my middle class home to somebody who grew up in church when they got saved to somebody who came from the, the streets in prison and got saved. The same angel sang the same song in heaven. It's all by the grace of God. Humility is having a deep moral sense of our own littleness. Then this word gentleness, beautiful word. This is where preotes, and it's, um, it's mostly translated meekness in the New Testament, and it's, gentleness is another way it's translated in certain places. Um, Spiro Zodiades in his um, Hebrew Greek key study Bible says it is the inward grace of the soul that accepts God's dealings with us as good. <clears throat> Excuse me. It is this, this gentleness or this meekness is directed towards God. Man is simply a recipient of it. So the apostle here, using this word, I thought this was interesting. He's saying, I'm using this word, gentleness. It's translated meekness maybe in your other translations, however they translate it. And he says, I, this is the inward grace of the soul that accepts God's dealings with me as good. So I'll pick on Andre a little bit because he's in the front row. So Andre hurts me, let's say. And, um, and, and he offends me, he wounds me, something he does hurts me. But I don't look at Andre, I said, okay, God, I don't know why he did this, don't know why he said that, don't know why he has it in for me, don't know why he hurt me, don't know why he ripped me off, don't know why he took advantage of me, don't know why any of these things. But I'm, because I'm trusting you, I'm accepting all your dealings with me as good. You see, it's not really about me looking beyond what he did, it's me looking to God, looking to Christ. That's what meekness is. That's what gentleness is. So we treat people with gentleness unto God. Not because they deserve it. Not because they earned it. 
We treat them with dignity and respect and love and honor and restoration unto God. Not because they've climbed a ladder somehow and achieved something. Then we had this word patience. I love this. This is the word, um, long, in some translations, long-suffering. Some of you know that I've talked about this word a lot through the years. It's, um, the, the Greek word is macrothumia, to suffer long. Thumia is macro is long, thumia is anger. And, um, and, the, and, the, and the Hebrew equivalent to this word, I think it's arak is the word. And it means the God with a big nose. That's the Greek word picture. The God with the big nose. You wonder, okay, what's that mean? God Jimmy Durante? No. No, it's, um, it's, it's um, who, who um, I have an older brother. Hopefully he's not watching. If you're watching, sorry. Um, and, and, and he's four years older than me. We, would, we were sports. We always played sports, 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 sports. We had table hockey. We had Stanley Cup playoffs every night. We had game after game. And we were always competing against one another. But because he was four years older than me, I didn't win much. Um, but as the years went on, I began to win. And one day, I beat him in Skittle Bowl. Remember that little game with the you spin, little Skittle Bowl? I beat him in Skittle Bowl. I won, and I probably did something I shouldn't have done. I went into my victory dance. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. He looked at me, and I looked at him. The nostrils started flaring. I, I knew what that meant. That meant I had to run for my life. And so I'm running, I'm, I'm running out, and, and I'm not exaggerating, darts from the dartboard are hitting the wall next to me as I'm, he's throwing darts at me. And then I, then I see him getting the BB gun. So now I'm not really running through the backyard. My victory dance was on a full sprint now. And I, and, I, and I jump behind a wheelbarrow in my backyard. And I hit it behind a wheelbarrow. And I hear bing, 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 bing. He's pegging the wheelbarrow trying to get a BB through the metal to pick me off or something like that. Because I beat him in a skittle bowl. See, I knew when to run because the nostrils flared. If his nostrils didn't flare, I'd still be doing the victory dance. But, but the nostrils gave, because I knew that the nostrils pointed to anger. So when he says the God who's long-suffering is a God with a big nose, it means his nostrils don't flare in anger. It takes a long time before God gets angry. Macrothumia, the man, um, this is the man who is long-suffering is he who is having to do with an injurious person, does not suffer himself easily to be provoked by them or blaze up in anger. That's Trench says that. So I don't let you get under my skin. That's how it translates out. I don't let you get me angry. I don't let you control my emotions and control my spirituality. Then it says we bear with, let's see if I get that right because every translation is different, bear with one another. This spoke of persons to bear with, have patience with regard to the errors and weaknesses of anyone. And written inside this word is beautiful. It means I have the right to respond. Let's all use Andre. Whatever, whatever he did to me, I have every right to react, every right to respond, and every right to defend myself. However, but because I'm bearing with one another in love, I don't. That's forbearance. That's this word, aneche. I don't respond, but I have the right to, but I, I forsake my own right for someone else. Then it says, in love, agape, God's unconditional love, absolutely selfless and will always do what's best for the recipient of that love. Do not mistake agape love with sentimental love. Don't make that mistake. Sentimental love does what's good for the person giving the love. Agape love does what's good for the person recipient, receiving the love. There's a difference. I love my daughter. I love her sentimentally. I love her unconditionally. But I'm, she's not getting broccoli. I mean, she's not getting ice cream for, for um, breakfast. But dad, I want it. No. You're getting cocoa puffs. <laughs> Something good. It's nutritious. See, it says fortified with vitamins and lots of sugar. So that's what you're getting. So we... So, Agape love means I do what's good for the recipient. So with that said, what do we, um, here we are, we have this umbrella, okay? I'm in my marriage, I'm in a relationship, maybe business, 
I'm in the church and I'm co-laboring with people in the church. There's a little antsy and, uh, and something like that. I have my umbrella. I'm married to a, I'm married to a an electrical circuit, just beep, zapping me all the time. And um, and I what 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 are we told to do? Scriptures tell us. Here's the gospel. Okay, if you go, if you take a, do a quick word study in the New Testament under one another, you'll find lots of things that Bible tells about one another. It says that we forgive one another. It says there's more in one place. I'm giving you one verse, but sometimes it says there's in many different places. Colossians three thirteen says we're kindly affection to one another. Romans twelve ten says we greet one another. Second Corinthians thirteen twelve. Let me say that again. We greet one another. So when you leave here, greet somebody. Don't go, honey, this church is over. Okay, race to the car. Greet, greet somebody. Say hi, give them a hug. Invite yourself over for lunch, something. Greet somebody. Serve one another, Galatians 5.13. Encourage one another and comfort one another, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 18. Edify, build each other up, 1 Thessalonians 5.11. Prefer one another above yourself, 1 Thessalonians 5.21. The gospel umbrella. Consider one another. Hebrews 10, 24, and about 10 times it says, love one another. 1 John 3, 11. That's my umbrella. This is what I stay under. This is my covering. I don't have to figure my husband out. I don't have to figure my wife out. I don't have to figure those people out. I just stay under the umbrella. I get my identity here. I get my worth here. I get my value here. I don't need you to approve me. I know I'm approved by God. I don't need you to be my identity. I know who I am in Christ. Because I don't need from you, I can give to you. Because I don't need from you, I don't have to manipulate you. I don't have to react to you. I don't have to shame you. I don't have to do any of those things because I don't need anything from you. I just want to give to you. That's the gospel umbrella. And it's easy. I write myself out of the equation. Let me read you this quote. I forgot this at the first service. I did it at the end, though. Here's a quote, Outreach Magazine. I just read it this morning. They have the whole um, um, edition is on uh, what churches are doing for marriages and helping marriages. And um, I don't probably need this anymore. You guys get the point, right? right. The, the roof keeps linking. I might need it, but... This is, here's a, here's a, here's a nine-week um, premarital session. This is week number two, this one church. He goes, couples, in, in session two, um, they, dis- they discuss the most important session of the program, most important session of the program. While contemporary culture teaches that marriage is all about an individual's needs being met, Brian and his team, that's the counseling team, want their soon-to-be married couples to understand that marriage is actually about demonstrating Christ's sacrificial love. I think we just said something like that. That becomes your purpose in marriage to display the same love and to die to self for your, for your bride or groom. It has nothing to do, here's the point, it has nothing to do with what I get out of marriage, but what I can give in the marriage. This idea that Christ and his gospel must be at the center of any Christian marriage is the foundation of our entire program. We've been given this covering, my friends. We don't look to it very often. We look horizontally. We don't look vertically. We don't look to this as our answer. We look over here. That person should treat me like this. They, treated, they spoke this way to me. They didn't do this for me. They starved me of affections over here. Whatever, whatever it is. But when the gospel becomes my passion, when the gospel becomes my identity, who I am in Christ, If I don't get my identity from the gospel, I'm going to get it through a person. I'm going to get it through a passion. I'm going to get it through a purpose. I'm going to get it through a position in a local church, whatever that is. But when I get it through Christ and his gospel, nothing can stop me. You want a marriage on rocket fuel? Start here. Start here. Okay, pastor, I I will, but what if my spouse doesn't start here with me? It's not about him or her starting with you. It's about you and Jesus. Start here. Go to that cross. Get your worth. Get your identity. Get your value from there. Get your needs met there. Emotional needs. Internal needs. You notice, my friends, I'll close. We'll, we'll see marriage verses throughout this series. We didn't use any this morning. 
This, this message could apply to any horizontal, earthly relationship you have. Take those same verses and the many that I didn't quote, the very many I didn't quote, that tells us how we treat one another in the New Testament, and you'll f- put those into your marriage. Don't, don't do it to get a response back. You do it because you do it under God. And, if, and a response is not relevant. And watch what God does and may God do in your relationships in life. Jesus, thank you for these words. Thank you for the precious people here. With every head bowed, every eye closed, as we do every service here at Grace Connection, we'd like to give you the opportunity not to join our church, but simply to join the family of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes on him should never perish, but have everlasting life. That's that's a whosoever goes out to the human race. Whosoever. On the cross, Jesus proposed, it's like marriage, he proposed to the human race, whoever believes on me, I'll be your groom, and you'll be my bridegroom. In the quiet place of your heart, if you are here this morning and you don't know where you'd spend eternity, if you died today, in a simple, simple prayer in your own way say dear Jesus thank you for dying on the cross for me thank you for shedding your blood for me today is my day of eternal life come into my life and save me